Today, we embark on a conversation that demands our attention, a topic shrouded in silence and wheeled in complexity. A home, a place that's supposed to be safe, but sometimes it becomes a battlefield. The thing is, what happens in that private space doesn't always stay there. We are connecting the dots between this private struggle and something you might not have thought about, immigration. Stick around because we are going to delve deep into the topic. Hello, everyone. You're watching Immigration and Jobs Talk Show. I'm your host, Rajni Bharara. And today, we are going to discuss how does what happens at home impact someone's immigration status? What are the ripple effects that go beyond just the people directly involved? we will uncover a story that goes beyond the surface. A story that shows how the challenges of home life can reach into unexpected places. Yes, everyone, today we are going to have a deep discussion on domestic violence and immigration consequences. We will also have a discussion on understanding New Jersey laws on domestic violence, civil and criminal laws, lodging a criminal complaint for DV, rights of the victims and legal process civil complaint, obtaining a TRO and FRO, rights of victim and legal process, impact of the FRO and criminal complaint on your immigration status. And last but not the least, VAWA, Act Eligibility of Victims of Domestic Violence to Obtain a Green Card. And to discuss all this, we have a legal maestro with us, Attorney Seema Singh. Seema Singh is an attorney at law for past 27 years. She earned her Juris Doctor at Seton Hall School of Law in 1995. Seema Singh served as a former public advocate designee and the ratepayer advocate for the state of New Jersey from 2001 to 2007 as a cabinet member for three New Jersey governors. She was also appointed by the New Jersey governors to serve on various task forces. State of New Jersey's Renewable Energy Task Force, New Jersey Clean Energy Council, Chairperson of Asian American Council. She is an experienced attorney and runs her own full service law firm in Princeton, New Jersey. I can go on and on with her achievements, but because we only have an hour show, I would like to directly welcome her. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Attorney Seema Singh. Hello, Daddy Seema. How are you? Thank you, Rajni. And uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm doing great. It's cold here in New Jersey, but we are doing well. Yeah, it is. It is. And I'm, you know, um, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. You know, on a Tuesday, you actually took your time out to do the show at 12 um, EST. So thank you so much for, you know, taking a time out and coming and doing the show. It means a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a great opportunity and a wonderful platform. So I'm happy to be here. Also, uh, Seema, I would like to say that, you know, I have already introduced you to the audiences. But since it is your first show and we'll be having more shows together, you know, in the coming weeks. But because, uh, like I said, it's your first show. Would you like to give your own introduction to the viewers who are watching us right now? Um, you've given a great introduction. Well, yes, I do run my own uh, law practice. And I enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy helping women. I enjoy helping businesses. Uh, I have a very diverse practice. And, um, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. I feel law, because I'm in law, mm -hmm. I can provide assistance and help to others. There are people who come to my office for divorce cases, and I try and get them back together with their spouse. And they wonder, are you really a divorce lawyer? So, you know, just following the law and doing... Uh, you know, what the law requires versus helping people really understand their lives. I think that's what I really enjoy about my work. And um, it, it's been a pleasure serving our community in New Jersey uh, with my legal practice. And, um, and now being on this TV show gives me another opportunity to reach out to so many, many others. And thank you. Of course, of course. Thank you so much, um, you know, for the lovely introduction again. And uh, everyone, please know that this session is uh, being streamed live on YouTube, LinkedIn and Facebook. And the handle is Immigration Talk Show. And don't forget to subscribe to us. That's a serious matter.
All right. Now, if you have any question to the attorney, wherever you're watching it from, please comment with your questions. We'll be glad to uh, take your questions. And now, without any further ado, let's take up our very first question of our topic, which is domestic violence and immigration consequences. So, um, attorney Seema, I would like to you know ask you. I don't know if I should say this or not, but uh, you know, since. Uh, you are the perfect person to answer this question. I would like to know from you, you know, people say that when two people are living together, whether you are married or not, right? If you're a couple, so pe people tend to have fights. You fight, then you move on, then you forget. And, you know, e everything goes um, happy the next day. But then when does these fights become domestic violence? When does things take turn as domestic violence? So if you can please talk about what domestic violence is and how it's legally defined in New Jersey. Sure. Um, so in New Jersey, domestic violence is covered by NJSA 2C colon 25-17. I know it's a legal statute, but under that uh, Prevention of Domestic Violence Act of 1991, there are many kinds of acts that are described which becomes domestic violence. For example, homicide, assault, terroristic threats to somebody, kidnapping, criminal um, false imprisonment, uh, sexual assault, uh, criminal sexual contact, lewdness, criminal mischief, burglary, criminal trespass, harassment, and stalking. Any of these acts that are performed against um, you know, victims, and who is a victim under this statute? There are three categories of victims. One is uh, anybody who's 18 years or older and those who are emancipated, and if they suffer any of those acts that I mentioned by your spouse, your former spouse, or any member of your household, that constitutes domestic violence. The second category of victims also includes people who are, and this is regardless of age. The first category, you have to be an adult or an emancipated um, minor. In the second category, it, it's regardless of age. If you are pregnant with somebody's child or if you've had a child with someone, who abuses you, that constitutes domestic violence. And then the third category is even dating relationships. If you're dating somebody and he commits any of those acts that I mentioned previously upon you, you are a victim of domestic violence. So those are what constitute domestic violence under New Jersey statutes. Okay, got it. And you know, you also talked about before, I mean, before the show uh, started, you were mentioning that during COVID is um, when domestic violence was at its peak, right? So That's correct. I was, you know, shocked that I used to get so many calls on a weekly basis, because that was the time when two parties are constrained in the home together. And that's right. when their actual relationship surfaces. And there yeah. used to be fights, there used to be I, I had domestic violence between a father and a daughter, leave alone right. spouses. A father and a daughter living together in their home uh, got into arguments. The cops were called. Uh, so I had a lot of situations where people just could not live 24-7 together. And there was a lot of violence during those times. Unfortunately, you know, with the police stations, they were, they were crowded. The jails were crowded. So we had to just separate these people. And, you know, they were they were not taking too many people into jail. They were, but not, you know, it had to be an extreme case. Um, but we used to work towards keeping them separated, either going into a hotel or, you know, with family members. And that was a, it was a peak of my DV cases was COVID. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, we already are getting so many questions from our viewers who are watching us on different platforms. We already have too many questions, but hold on viewers. I still have many questions to ask from attorney Seema. So you'll have to wait for a bit. But uh, now that, you know, after um, um, answering this question is so beautiful, I would like to now um, ask you about how does this legal definition impact the way domestic violence cases are uh, prosecuted and defended in court? If you can please talk about this. So uh, when you say prosecuted, first of all, uh, a DV case has to start, right? So mm -hmm. the, 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 the best way they start is if an incident takes place in your home, you call the police, the police comes right. in, they'll see an issue of domestic violence, they will either uh, arrest the perpetrator, and then the victim is given an opportunity to file a temporary restraining order. And then if the police see an aggravated case, they may themselves file a criminal complaint against the perpetrator. And if they don't, then they will leave it up to the, uh, the victim to either file a TRO or to file an, a criminal complaint 
uh, they may not take that stance. And if a police files a complaint, then it becomes a state versus that individual. And right. so then at that point, a criminal case starts if the police files it. And then it's up to the victim to file a TRO or not. And nine out of 10 times from our Indian community, the women back out and the cops get so frustrated because yeah. they've, you know, stretched themselves to do that. And then the woman backs out. Um, so that that's how it starts. Once a TRO is filed, then within a, a 10 day period, the court must schedule a hearing for a final restraining order. Now that can be extended if you know mm -hmm. the attorneys agree and the, the case is moved uh, and they're working out a settlement or getting into civil restraints, then that period can move. But a TRO can either be converted into an FRO through a trial or a hearing. Mm -hmm. If it's not, it can be dismissed or withdrawn by the victim. Okay, okay. But then, you know, uh, what are the first legal steps a uh, victim of domestic violence should take? Well, the first step you take if you're being beaten up is call the police, 911 okay. ASAP. And you start right there. Uh -huh. um, a lot of women will get beaten up, they'll sit for a week, 10 days, and then walk yeah. over to the police station and start. It, it, it takes away from the legitimacy of the, of the case. So if you are really being abused, do not wait. Start your process. Call the police. That's the first step. And then the cops will tell you, you can file a TRO where he is removed from the home. They can mm -hmm. file a criminal case if they see a lot of injury and damage to your, uh, you know, your, um, to your body. Mm -hmm. They can commence us. But that still doesn't get you a TRO. A TRO has to be filed by the victim. And mm -hmm. a lot of victims do not file the TRO. So they, they are living in the same house because till you file a TRO, a police cannot remove the perpetrator. They cannot remove right. your abuser. Mm -hmm. They can only remove them when there is a TRO. So okay. that's where you start. And a TRO, if you go with the police and file it right there and then, it's done in the municipal court. And a municipal judge, even on a weekend, it has, takes these emergent cases mm -hmm. and your TRO becomes However, if you wait a week, 10 days after the abuse has occurred, then you have to walk over to the civil court, the, the Superior Court of New Jersey, the family division, and you have to file it yourself over there. Okay. 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 All right. Um, uh, you know, you have explained this in, in so much detail, but still I would like to ask from you that are there any specific time frames or conditions that a victim must adhere to when taking these steps? So a, t a TRO is uh, is given very uh, liberally because mm -hmm. judges don't want to be in a position that they don't give a TRO and th there's a death or mm -hmm. you know the wife is even further beaten up. So TROs are given very liberally. You go before a municipal judge. That's if you call the police. The police will take you in. They'll bring a judge on. Uh, these days they happen on Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. The judge comes on. You uh, they will make you certify or you know just tell what happened and the judge will make a decision will immediately enter a tro that tro is immediately served to the abuser he has to leave the home and okay. the tro will specify whether you have exclusive possession of the house you'll get a car you know whatever requirements there are you'll bring it up to the judge and you know if bills have to be paid you'll tell the judge that you know the bills have to be paid he'll he'll address that in the tro so you're not left stranded financially. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's how a TRO starts. 10 days after the hearing should be set, but generally attorneys get involved. And then we mm -hmm. work out between ourselves. Okay, let's try and work out civil restraints, uh, which means it, you know, you're know you trying to come into a settlement. Because if you right. go for a trial and an FRO is entered and it, the, the abuser is found guilty, it may not be good for that abuser. And abuser generally are spouses. So right. it may negatively impact that entire household. So mm -hmm. TROs are never, um, they do not expire. They are always there till you mm -hmm. have it withdrawn or dismissed. Mm -hmm. But they have okay. to be converted into an FRO or withdrawn or dismissed. You can't have them hanging in the courts. The courts will try and tell you either you dismiss it, withdraw it, or you come to court do a hearing and let the court decide whether a FRO should be entered or the court should uh, dismiss it by order. 
Okay. So but you don't do anything with it. A TRO remains. Okay. Okay, got it. Uh, but uh, but then you know, uh, I mean, you you also mentioned you know generally spouses are the ones uh, uh, who do all these things. I mean, uh, the domestic violence and all these things. I mean, majorly uh, spouses are the ones on, on whom you know the cases are being filed. But we saw a very famous case, um, uh, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, where you know the uh, I mean the judgment was in uh, the men's favor. So what do you have to say about that? Are people open up? Are, are men? Yeah. Unfortunately, there are many men who are being abused. Yeah. Um, I've had a case uh, about six months ago where the man was being thoroughly abused. And it happens. I mean, I ha- I represented him and he had deep scratches on his face. And I had recordings where the woman was gloating and literally, uh, you know, he was petrified of her and he literally obeyed whatever she said. So, yes, there are cases where uh-huh. women are abusers as well. And then there are many cases where women are faking these DVs because they are under the notion that, okay, um, I want to start a divorce. Let me get him out of the house. Let me file this uh, frivolous complaint and get that done. Uh, but, you know, it, you have to prove this. For an yeah. FRO to be entered and for a permanency to that this, to those restraints, you have to go to a hearing. Right. And all of that surface is there. So maybe that's, I, I, you know, I don't, I didn't really follow that case, but I don't know what the facts were. But yes, it happens all the time. I had represented um, a kid, I would call him. He was about 26 years old. And for me, he's a kid. Um, yeah. He got married to this woman from India. They, he brought her here and she was gorgeous looking. He was not. And that's what led to it. She just came here because she wanted a green card. And now she was, you know, coached by someone uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, she had relatives in Washington. She went there, met this lawyer um, mm-hmm. and he sort of coached her that, oh, you go back, you know, you do this, uh, call the cops, get him thrown out. Um, mm-hmm. And she did exactly that. And this kid was petrified of her. Mm-hmm. He did it. You know, he followed her, obeyed her, did everything she wanted. But I did the whole trial. We had a full trial on it. And there was a criminal proceeding and a civil proceeding going on simultaneously. And in the civil proceeding, um, I caught her on many, many acts. You you go into details of, oh, okay, he hit you. Let's describe it. Describe that scene. And, oh, then he shoved me on the bed. And then I, you know, uh, the second time around, she says, oh, and then I was crawling and going. So you you give, you it's a tell, right? You <laughs> Sooner or later, the truth surfaces. And that case right. was dismissed against her. The criminal mm-hmm. complaints were dismissed. So there are women who misuse the entire act to their mm-hmm. uh, to their benefit. And there are men who are being abused as well. I have had three cases like that. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, yes, we are, we are also getting chats according to this topic of, you know, fake cases from um, Rakesh Kumar and Falgun. So they are also mentioning these fake cases. So we are definitely going to take your chats. Um, but... In the meanwhile, okay, we I think we already have a chat on screen. So Falgun says, um, okay, let's take our first uh, question then. Falgun says, um, Falgun has posted this comment on um, YouTube and Falgun says that what protection is available to husband against Indian wife who lie in US courts presenting false DB, 498A cases from India to hide wives, violence and child abduction. What do you have to say? So I'm a little unclear as to the wife is living in the U.S. or she's living in India. I think she is. Uh, she is living clear. in U.S. That, that's why she's lying in the U.S. court, I guess. So if she's in uh, in the U.S. in the U.S. and he's in the U.S., those four ninety eight cases, uh, is there a divorce going on as well? Because what I do is in the divorce court, I make the judge enter an order that she has to dismiss all the 498 cases if the divorce is proceeding in New Jersey. And and I've had a lot of success with that, where the courts in the U.S. will say, if your divorce is proceeding in the U.S., you cannot file anything in India. I get an order right away. So okay. I'm not sure. Uh, there, there has to be more facts. Um, if this case is going on in India and they are here and there is no divorce, um, I know at this time in India, they have counseling and the wives have to prove these. I mean, they're not that easy anymore. 
and even the Indian courts, the Indian law used to be very, very strict. I mean, without asking questions, if it was a non-bailable offense, they would lock you up. But it's changed now because of these fake cases. Now they have counseling and mediation that is scheduled. Mm -hmm. I had a client whose uh, husband went to India and filed that, and I flew her down from here to go mediate that case. And she came back, we were successful. So I need more details to answer this um, more appropriately. Okay, so Falgun, um, you know, if you can please in detail write your question, whether are you going through a divorce or not, so that, you know, um, Seema would be able to answer it more specifically related to your case. Now, uh, I think we can take another question, another because we already have too many questions going on here from the viewer side. So next question is from uh, Rakesh Kumar. And uh, Rakesh has also posted this on uh, YouTube. So Rakesh wants to know what advice do you have for husband to deal with wives who indulge in physical violence against husband in US, then hide in India and file false TV 498A case in India? What do you have to say? Again, is the wife a, a citizen? Is she a green card holder? I mean, those, the, the, the visa status matters. The husband's visa status matters. Does he have family in India? Um, I mean, there are a lot of questions I need answered before I can give you an answer to this. And if they hide in India, they can't be hiding if they file the case against you. They have to be there. Um, right. right. So the husband can also go file a case against her. Mm -hmm. he, he should do that. I mean, you have to be very proactive. But if he's a U.S. citizen, he can tell the Indian courts that that law doesn't apply to them. I'm a citizen of the, of the U.S. So that 498 case doesn't apply to me. Okay. Okay. So Rakesh, so again, I, I need more details about Rakesh before I can, you know, assist him. Maybe he can call me offline. Okay. Yes, uh, definitely. Rakesh, uh, if you have um, any questions or if you need any help, you definitely can contact attorney Seema. Uh, she'll be there to help you. But for now, uh, if you can please write your questions in detail, users and viewers, audiences, you're watching us right now from different platforms i would request you to please write your questions in detail so that we can you know uh, give answers properly uh, related to your questions um now i would like to again you know uh, come to our question our topic questions uh, so we were talking about tro you know you were um, talking about how can one file tro so my next question to is uh, to you is how does one go about filing a temporary restraining order tro in new jersey if you can please talk about this i, I just covered that so the way to start it is you either when the offense takes place the incident takes place you call 911 the cops will come they will take the uh, abuser in uh, arrest him hopefully you know if, if it's very very se serious if they come in they see you're just arguing they're just going to give you a warning and leave uh once they take the abuser in they're going to uh you know advise you that if you they you know they tell you about your rights do you want to file a tro so that we can keep him away from you that's the time the municipal judge comes up you uh, you know you certify you uh basically um, you know testify to whatever happened the TRO is granted right there and then. Then it's served upon the abuser. He has to vacate the premises if you've been given exclusive possession of the of the home. And even if the home is on the abuser's name, because you're married and you're living in that house, even if you're a parent living in that house, does not mean that you will not be allowed to stay there. Because you've been living there, you will be allowed to stay there temporarily uh, till everything is resolved. So that's the best way to file a TRO. If you don't file it there and then, you wait. You have to go to Superior Court of New Jersey and you have to make an application. The judge of Superior Court will bring you in front, hear your testimony and decide if it's legitimate or not and give you a TRO. So two ways you can do it. Okay. Okay. Got it. But then uh, still, I would like to know from you that are there any specific documentation or evidence, you know, typically required to successfully file a TRO? No, you just have to testify. And if you have bruises and injuries, that's your that's your documentation. And if the cops come and they have a police report written up, that's your documentation. But a TRO happens so suddenly that you don't need much documentation. And the courts are very vigilant. They liberally give you a TRO because it's a temporary situation. So they don't need too much documentation at that point. But when the FRO hearing comes, that's when you have to prove your case. 
Okay. Yeah, I was about to ask you that uh, actually. So, you know, when you convert the TRO to FRO, what specific evidence is typically required to obtain a final restraining order, FRO? So, if you have to go for a final restraining order, there has yeah. to be a full blown trial. Okay. okay. Nobody is going to say, okay, great, I'm, I'm ready for a final restraining order to be entered. The husband will stand and do it. The wife will say, you did it. So now there's a hearing. Uh -huh. Okay. At that hearing, it's like a mini trial. You have to prove your case. And uh -huh. you have to show, uh, so if, say, it's the wife or the husband who is the victim, they have to show the existence of immediate danger uh, mm -hmm. to that person or property. First of all, they have to show what happened that day and uh -huh. you know the abuse that took place they have to show uh, any prior history you can go through a whole testimony of prior history you may have proofs and documentations if you were taken to the hospital there are medical right. records um, you know it depends it's a, it's on a case by case basis you could have uh, witnesses who have seen you being beaten up you bring them on so we have several witnesses coming so you have to show prove your case what happened that day you got bruised if there were injuries, you were taken to the hospital on that day, you pr present all of that. Okay. So that's step one. Step two is go into priors. What happened in prior? In this year, he did this to me. I have this uh, TRO filed at that time. So you, mm -hmm. you pull up all the prior history. You have witnesses mm -hmm. previously, you bring them on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to basically prove your case by showing that if I continue to live with him, there's a um, existence of immediate danger to me and my you to my person and my property. So I need him. I need a FRO to be safe. You have to show the danger to you. Okay. And then, you know, it and and the best interest of the um, the victim and the, if there are children, you have to show that this FRO will be to the best interest. Otherwise, there will be further negative consequences if the FRO is not entered. He may come and do uh, kill me or he may come and, you know, kidnap me or whatever you want to show. And then you also show the financial circumstances so that the finances are addressed up mm -hmm. in up in the FRO. So, for example, if the husband is the the bread earner and the you know the right. paying all the bills, you put it up front in the FRO. There are sections there where the judge will say, okay, he has to maintain the status quo, continue paying the bills even though he's removed from the home. He has to pay you know for the children's uh, support or whatever else you need. If there are two cars, the wife has to get one car, he can take one car. So all of those things are worked out in an FRO. Because at that point, there is no divorce, right? If a divorce is filed subsequently, then all of that can, gets converted into, mm -hmm. uh, into the divorce court. So even the FRO order is, is permanent. It remains until it is changed or withdrawn or dismissed by the party or converted into a divorce. But the FRO remains till you dismiss it. Okay. So even okay. if a divorce starts, when there right. is an FRO, you cannot be in touch with your spouse. You have okay. to, there are restraints. You cannot go near her right. work or um, if she's going to school or if in the, the house, uh, there are common, maybe a common temple they go to. You can't go there. So all of those are identified. The judge will ask you, where all do you go? And all of that are identified so that he doesn't come anywhere near that, that place. Okay. Okay. Got it. And also, you know, Seema, what happens is, I mean, especially with Indian community, I would like to ask this question um, in reference to, you know, the Indian community people, especially women, you know, they feel ashamed when things like these happen, they feel ashamed and also um, things become, uh, things become complicated. I mean, they doubt, should they take legal help or not and what if money becomes the problem what what is the society going to say i mean a lot of pressures you know a lot a lot, lot of um uh, problems and a lot of uh, things occur in uh, especially in women's mind so what do you any specific message that you would like to um you know say to them first, first of all i would say it's not only women men mm -hmm. undergo that yeah. as well so it's right. for both men and women. What I would say is if you're living in an abusive relationship, you need to quit it ASAP. Do not wait for something really drastic to happen where you are either very badly injured or you die. There have been uh, DV cases where people have been killed as a result of DV. So do not wait. Separate. Separate right away. And then work things out if you, if you can get counseling, get anger management. You know, if you really want to be together, 
you need to get out of that situation to decide whether you want to get back in there with all the modifications. So, you know, the judge can send a person to anger management for counseling, for therapy. Children are sent for therapy after BV cases as well. So there's a lot available out there. And sometimes mm -hmm. domestic violence takes place because of financial pressures. During COVID, there was a lot of that going on. So even though there is a lot of love that happened, but doesn't mean you continue staying there without making some changes. For example, going for counseling, going for therapy, going for anger management, realizing what the issues are, then get back or just separate permanently. It's okay. Children are better off with parents amicably yeah. divorcing each other than to be subjecting them to all that abuse and anger and, you know, all that the violence that they see. It's not fair to them. Definitely, definitely. And thank you so much for, you know, mentioning all these important things in the show. I mean, um, people are really, really enjoying this um, informative episode. And also, you know, we are 30 minutes into the show, Seema, but it only feels like five minutes because the show is so engaging and so informative. And I'm sure, you know, all of um, the viewers who has joined us from different platforms, they, are, they too are, um, you know, enjoying this informative show. So everyone just stay tuned. We are definitely going to take up your questions. But uh, for now, I would like to thank you so much. And um, I would like to also say that I hope so far the session is informative and helpful to you and if you need any help regarding this matter don't forget to reach out to attorney Seema you can call her at 609-454-3168 yes and you can also mail her at a Seema at ssinglaw.com or you could also visit her website which is www.ssinglaw.com and www.seemasing.com and um uh, right now, uh, we have a lot many questions that I need to ask from Seema and also I need to take viewers, your questions as well. But right now, it's time that we take a short break because break is important. So we'll be right back. Are you an IT consultant seeking a new opportunity? We offer job placement services for U.S. citizens, green cards, EADs, and visa holders. We also sponsor various work visas like H-1B, E3, TN, and green cards. 20-plus years of experience in the industry. Exceptional employee benefits. Highly rated by our employees. Global presence with 200-plus recruiters and direct clients. Connect with us. Call us on the number. 833-412-8472 or mail us at support at higheritpeople.com or visit our website www.higheritpeople.com Welcome back. You're watching Immigration and Jobs Talk Show. I am Rajni Bharara and I hope so far the session was informative and helpful to you. If you need any help regarding, you know, before the break also I said this, I would like to say this again. If you need any help regarding this topic, don't forget to reach out to attorney Seema Singh. You can call her at 609-454-3168. You could also mail her at uh, seema at ssinglaw.com and you can also visit her website which is Seema Singh. Com. And remember, if you're looking for project placement or visa sponsorship, uh, you can reach out to me at Rajni at higheritpeople.com, uh, which is my uh, mail ID, Rajni at higheritpeople.com. And you can also give me a call or reach me via WhatsApp at plus one seven three two um, seven zero seven nine one five one. You could also visit our website, which is www.hireitpeople.com. Remember, we also sponsor H-1B visas and green cards. Atani Seema, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now, uh, you know, promotion is done. Everything is done. So now let's come back to the topic once again. I still have a lot many questions that I need to ask from you. But because our viewers are really, really waiting so that, you know, we can take up their question and we can um, give them some guidance. I mean, I cannot, but you definitely can. So I can take their question and you can give them some guidance. All right. So without any further ado, let's just take a Somesh Pandit's question. So Somesh wants to know, uh, he has posted this on YouTube. I'm just mentioning where he posted because, you know, I want the viewers to know that we are streamed live on LinkedIn, Facebook and uh, YouTube. So which is um, immigration talk show is our um, um, handle. 
So uh, Somesh Pandit has posted this um, question on YouTube. So Somesh wants to know, my wife has asked for one crore alimony. She keeps threatening me that she will call the police, throw me out of the house and take 50% of my property. Now, he has not said anything um, after this, but I think he wants to know what should he do. So um, my first question to Somesh is, is there a divorce pending? And is it in New Jersey? Is it in India? Um, and also, I need to know that if she's threatening him, mm -hmm. I would suggest he separate from her right away before she gets gets him enrolled in some false case. And if if a wife is threatening you daily, uh, why would you want to live with her? Yeah. So there are many questions, Somesh, I have of you, which I need um, to know before I can answer that question. Okay, and one I think... Could have... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, Somesh, uh, I mean, all, everyone who's watching us right now and are watching, I mean, are sending questions, are asking, I think they're living in the US and that's where they are asking this question from. So, so I guess Somesh is living in US and um, his divorce is, divorce is going on. That's why uh, his wife is asking for one crore alimony, if I'm not wrong. So, alim so alimony, uh, one crore is an Indian amount. So that's why I was thrown off. Yeah whether it was in New Jersey or India. But uh, Alamo, there are three components to a divorce, equitable distribution, um, child support, and you know other child-related expenses, and college included in that. And the third is alimony. And there are formulas to calculate it. Child support has a child support guidelines formula. Alimony, you look at, there's a new alimony law that you look at with various factors that have to be fulfilled as to the amount and the duration of the alimony. So, mm -hmm. you know, you see how much they earn, whether the wife needs the alimony, how many years they are married. I mean, just because she wants one crore doesn't mean she's going to get it. And I don't think Somesh should be threatened or scared. However, if she says she's going to, you know, she's threatening you, she'll call the police, I would mm -hmm. immediately do something about it because I've seen a lot of this these kind of cases where they mm -hmm. threaten and it actually ends up, uh, they end up filing a false case where the, the, the man is, you know, enroped in this false DV or and they take over the house. Um, yeah. He's thrown out on the street. So mm -hmm. I would I would immediately at least separate. If you have a divorce going on, you need mm -hmm. your attorney to write a letter and tell the other attorney that she needs to back off. Even in the home, there should be restricted conversation between the two of you. Talk through your attorneys if there is a divorce pending. And you know, stay in different ends of the house. But bring this to the attention of the other attorney immediately because you don't want to get um, you know, blindsided by her filing something false against you. So there are formulas. I mean, I don't know why she's demanding one crore. I don't know how much you make, Somesh, how much she makes. All of those factors go into it. And she cannot just take 50% of your property. Yes, New Jersey, you do uh, share 50-50, but they all have to be marital assets. If you have premarital assets, that taken out of the pot before the division takes place. So, you know, she's threatening you, but I'm not sure how legitimate her threats are. But okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't just sit on it. I would take some action, have a letter sent immediately. Okay. I mean, uh, he posted a follow-up question, but you all have already answered it. So we are not going to read out that particular question. But, you know, before I take up another chat uh, question, uh, Seema, I would like to know from you, People say, some people say it's wrong so because, you know, now that we, we had this question regarding alimony. So I want to know, you know, people say prenup is wrong. Some say it's right. So what's your take on prenup? So I think the prenup just um, defines the intent of the parties. A lot of them will say that we are starting our marriage by yeah. thinking of divorce. Right. Um, and honestly, if you uh, position your assets in a certain way, when you get married, those won't be touched. So a prenup may not even be needed. Any okay. premarital assets, if they're kept separate and not mm -hmm. intermingled in your marital assets, your spouse cannot touch that in, a, in the event of a divorce. And people forget that. They don't know that. So if you position your assets, if you have premarital assets, don't intermingle it with your marital assets. So okay. your spouse... If in the event of an unfortunate event of a divorce, they can't touch that. So okay. equitable distribution is saved. But anything you make in the marriage, mm -hmm. normally people will write in the prenups, you know, you keep yours, I keep mine. Yeah. I just think it's very unfair. When you're married, 
you are building things together. So both of you should have equal share to that. That's my take on it. Uh, I feel morally it's wrong. So some prenups I read are so egregious that mm -hmm. I yell at the clients, why would you even sign this? I mean, a okay. waiver of alimony, uh, I'll keep on, just because the wife wants one house, the husband mm -hmm. will take everything else from her. I've, I've just got a, a, a case that I've started a week ago. And I read that um, they had a separation agreement. I read that and it was horrific. But I uh -huh. could, you know, pull out stuff from it that was uh, against public policy, against New Jersey law, and I'm fighting her, fighting for her on that. So you ha you have to be fair. Even if you do a prenup, make it fair. Um, okay. But if you position your assets, you don't need a prenup. Okay. But then, you know, being an attorney yourself, what would you suggest? I mean, if if a couple is coming to you and they're about to get married and they ask you, um, if, should they, I mean, go ahead with the prenup or not? What would you say? So if you are getting married for the first time, okay. you have no kids, no one, you're young, no prenup. If you okay. are getting married a second time and both parties have kids, you have properties, then a prenup is desirable. Because you oh. want to make sure that your responsibilities are taken care of and no, you know, you're not ending up distributing to someone else's kids and your spouse. Right. So that's my take on prenups. I mean, that's a great take, I must say. And uh, all right, thank you so much for answering the question so amazingly. Now I would like to again move to our viewers and uh, take up their questions. Uh, so next we have Razna, and Razna has posted this. Uh, question on YouTube and Rajna wants to know if there is a domestic violence court case and police case against someone, is it advisable to raise a fresh H-1B for that person? How would a fresh H-1B help? When there is a TRO, and I, let me clear some uh, very important points regarding um, TROs and FROs and domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. TROs and FROs. TRO gets converted to an FRO. An FRO is a civil uh, it's through a civil complaint so it's never expunged and fro always remains on your record mm -hmm. okay so it creates a criminal record and any background searches would bring that up it mm -hmm. never goes away so whenever an fro comes we attorneys try and reason with our clients if you get an fro entered you're actually going to damage his career so we yeah. get into civil restraints in, instead and you know, keep the wife safe. At the same time, we don't damage the 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 abuser. So, raising a fresh H one B, I'm not sure how that would help because you are, are you changing the name? Are you changing the identity of the person? Because he's already there in the system. Right. Okay. And if it becomes a criminal case and a felony, mm -hmm. it's an automatic deportation for that person if they are not a U.S. citizen. They're automatically deported if it becomes a felony and you're in on an H1B. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, oh, okay, one so, more thing. Uh, one yeah. Also, an FRO is a is a civil is civil. However, if you violate the FRO FRO order and mm -hmm. go in front of your spouse and again uh, commit domestic violence that becomes a criminal case. And if you're in an H-1B, you're going to be sent back. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for answering the question, uh, Seema. Razna, I hope you have got your answer. And now we would like to move ahead to our ne next question. And uh, to everyone who's watching us right now from different platforms, I would like to say that if you're finding this uh, show engaging and informative, Please don't forget to subscribe to us. And now let's take another question. And uh, yes, uh, Let me, we before you go into the other other question, I just want to also say when an FRO is entered, the person, mm -hmm. the abuser is fingerprinted. Their mm -hmm. mugshot, their fingerprinted, all of that is in the system. So I just wanted to throw that out. Okay. Okay. And uh, as you can see, we have uh, Seema's details, you know, uh, right there. So you can note them down. Uh, you can contact her at um, her mail ID is Seema at ssinglaw.com. Websites are www.ssinglaw.com and uh, seemasing.com. And you can also reach her uh, via, you know, uh, phone. Uh, her contact number is 609-454. Three one six eight, and her other number is two zero one four two five eight three two two. 
All right, now let's again uh, take our user question, viewer question. And the next question that we have is from James. Okay, James wants to know something. And James has posted this on YouTube. And James is asking, friend with approved I-140 and pending I-485 faced false assault charges, lawyer working on dismissal, and seeking advice on the impact on H-1B extensions, stamping, EAP, AP renewals and I-485 approval. So if your lawyer is trying to get it dismissed, if you already have faced false, false assault charges, was that person fingerprinted, there are mug shots, but until you are convicted, nothing can happen. So the false charges, if they're dismissed, nothing happens. It's mm -hmm. fine. Okay. And I if, think that's if, it. if there's a conviction, then uh -huh. yes, then, then you are going to be deported. And then okay. they stop your uh, processes. It's right. automatic deportation uh, if there is a conviction and it's a felony. Okay. But these are okay. all charges if a, a lawyer can get it dismissed and mm -hmm. get it downgraded to a mm -hmm. misdemeanor, he'll be fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Or even get it completely dismissed. A downgrading is also good mm -hmm. okay and i think the lawyer like uh, james said the lawyer is on uh is already working on uh, getting his dismissed i guess yes. so i don't think it should be any problem for james um if he is able to do that um all right so now i think we can take another viewer question and the next uh, question that we have is from atin so Atin has posted this on YouTube and Atin wants to know, I have apprehension that wife might do some major harm against me. How do I decide it is high time? How do I save myself from future liabilities from any potential litigations from wife? Why is she still your wife? You should be fighting a divorce, getting separated uh, and not living in the same home if you are you, you have such fear. Why would you be in that? A lot of times people, due to economic reasons, remain together. But there, there, there are serious consequences to it if you already are uh, fearful of what she might do. So it's high time you either sit across the table or you know get a third party mediator involved who can help you all separate amicably or you know resolve your issues. I'm not sure what the issues are and what these future liabilities of litigation, I mean, what litigation are you talking about? Are you talking about a domestic violence? Um, so if you are fearful of domestic violence, you should separate right now. Don't wait for the worst to happen. Okay. Okay. So Aden, you have heard it, um, you know, from the legal maestro herself, uh, do what she says. And I hope now that um, she has answered the question, you have got uh, a proper answer to her question. And now I would like to take another viewer question. So can we have... Uh, next question on screen, please. And it is posted on Facebook. And uh, Saurabh Bagrawal um, has posted uh, this on Facebook. And Saurabh wants to know, my wife had done a DV incident where she threatened to cut me with a knife. I have audio records. This was five years ago. Then she left to India immediately to be with her paramour and now trying to file a false case, cases in India to harass me, any my parent. What do you have to say? Again, are you a U.S. citizen? Is she uh, Does she have any status in the U.S.? Those things matter a lot because you can move those cases here. Secondly, mm -hmm. if she's filing a false case, you have audio records. Mm -hmm. You can proactively reach out to the cops there and mm -hmm. file. A, uh, I don't want to talk about Indian law, but I know there's some preventive uh, uh, preemptive order that you can get against her. So, you know, you should do that present all these and, and, and let the, the police know that this is what she's trying to do. And I want to uh, preemptively uh, mm -hmm. get an order to protect myself and my, my parents because this is what she's doing. Okay. Okay. Right. And get Saurabh, a divorce. I mean, if she's with someone else, why are you even married to her? Sarp says uh, she was on H4 visa. So, but she still has a valid H4 visa. You're not divorced yet. So her H4 visa is still valid. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're on an H1 if she's on an H4. So do as I told you. I mean, go there, uh, file your own um, complaint against her. Mm -hmm. um, 
I know it's called a term in India, and I can't recall that. I don't do Indian law, but I can definitely find you somebody in India to help you. Uh, file that, show them the the record, so that when she comes to file, you're already in court, having filed against her. Okay, and you know what? When you said um, she is, you if you both are divorced, and uh, Saurabh has posted, no, I think they both are not yet divorced. So. Okay, so now Saurabh, okay, he says no, but so then... You, uh, so is Saurabh scared to file the divorce because of her threats in India that she'll do, you know, file yeah. these false cases? So first do what I said, file something in India and you can file your divorce case here. Okay. You can file your divorce case here, submit it to her. Once your divorce goes through, her H4 is cancelled. She can't come here. But I guess he's afraid of his parents being there. So yeah. that first part, what I said, could protect your parents from her false cases. Saurabh, I hope you have got the answer for your question. Thank you so much for um, asking the question. And um, now we would like to uh, take another viewer question. So can we have next question on screen, please? And the next question is from men are not ATMs. OK. Um, someone with this username men are not ATMs has posted this on YouTube. If a girl from India marries an NRI guy for visa slash green card comes to USA and runs away with her boyfriend within a few days, can the guy do anything to get her visa green card revoked? Does she already have a green card? Because there's a two year uh, period where uh, it's a temporary and then you um, extend it after two years. Mm -hmm. So you can write to the immigration and you know send them the proofs and tell them that you're not renewing her i know there's a temporary two year and then that gets extended um so he, he has to tell me there was somebody from pakistan who came lately and they got a permanent 10-year green card and i was quite amazed because mm -hmm. my understanding is that you first get a two year when you get married and come and then you have to go back and apply for the renewal for the for the rest of the you know 10 yeah. years so I'm not sure what kind of a green card she got or did she get it or not. Um, but yes, you can submit a query or a complaint to the USCIS and get that attempt to get it to work. Okay. Okay. So you definitely can try um, uh, men are not ATM. I mean, um, I hope you have got the answer for your question. And uh, thank you so much, Seema, for answering it. And next we have... Okay, we have um, a follow-up question from Somesh Pandit. And uh, Somesh, uh, if you remember, you know, our question in the beginning uh, when we took, I think, our first viewer question. So he's asking that, ma'am, thank you so much for answering me. I'm living in fear because I've heard that my wife can go to India and drag my parents in court as well. Okay. But she's in the U.S. right now, right? I she's think, in the uh, U.S. Yeah. So file your, file your divorce, file your mm -hmm. divorce, and... Once your divorce is filed, you make sure that you get a court order that you cannot do any filings in India and drag your parents. Everything happens here. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, Somesh, I hope uh, you've got the answer for your question. Now, next, uh, we are going to take another question. So, can we have um, next question on screen, please? It's by Rohan. And Rohan has posted this on YouTube. And Rohan wants to know, will domestic violence conviction prevent your receiving a U.S. visa or green card? So, not necessarily unless it is a felony or it is a um, contempt of your FRO order, then it becomes criminal. And yes, then you could, that could prevent you from getting a US visa or a green card. And if you're on um, an H1 or a green card, you can be deported. But just getting an FRO in itself, no. But if you're convicted of another crime, then yes, if it's a felony, it goes up to the level of a felony, then yes. And there's jail time involved as well with that. But remember, and just receiving an FRO itself is mm -hmm. um, pretty uh, traumatizing because it remains. FROs cannot be expunged. Yeah. It will always come up in a background search. Anytime you do a search, it comes up. So it could affect your employment. It could affect your employment having an FRO. Okay. Okay. So, Rohan, I hope you've got the answer for your question. And Asima, uh, okay, uh, before I take up another viewer question, I would like to know from you, you know, you must have got 
several bizarre and weird cases and especially you know when you talk about uh, when you spoke about covid so you uh, mentioned that you have got the most number of cases during covid so can you ma- mention one specific weird or bizarre case that you thought okay this is like a completely um, i mean it's getting out of hand or it's so weird for you as is well. it like not during covid just generally in my practice right Mm-hmm. So I had this one case, and I did a, a very big jury trial. I got a big award for that as well. Um, and I love mentioning this case because uh, you know it's just to encourage people who are being abused that you know you should not take it. Um, mm-hmm. I there was a very big family in New Jersey, a well very well known to me. They uh, took their son to India, got him married to this young girl. She was like twenty one when she got married, and they brought her here. and she was going through massive abuse in that home not only by her husband who was you know cheating on her drinking and coming back uh, pushing her away demeaning her her in-laws uh, she was being slapped left right and center given uh, so her brother reached out to me from india and i took up that case when she walked into my office she looked like a living skeleton oh so what God. she did was eventually got the strength and she ran away from there she mustered courage and she ran away went back to india and when she landed at the airport the parents were devastated because they couldn't even recognize their daughter so um the brother then brought her back to the us um, they came straight to my office from the airport and the first day she came her head was down she was timid as anything and i had to literally infuse a lot of confidence and courage in her and i told her so you you want to fight then get ready i need you to be strong and uh, short you know long story short i got her a place to live i told them she has to remain in the us while the case is pending so we filed um, a divorce case along with domestic torts mm-hmm. against the in-laws and the husband so i dumped everybody in there and at the end of it when i started my jury trial i put her before and after pictures and i won my case in that first minute i had these white jurors who were crying in the stand because they couldn't believe what somebody could do to a poor child and got a big jury verdict so in a divorce case if there has been massive abuse mm-hmm. you can add a component of domestic torts uh, to it as well mm-hmm. so assault battery you know and and i remember one case where the husband hit her so badly that she injured her Ooh. eye and she had several eye surgeries after that So those are domestic torts, and those can be dumped in a divorce case, and you can get big damages for it. So with this jury trial, we got not only her settlement from the divorce, but we got separate from the jury for all the um, the emotional trauma, the physical ruination of her health. We got a huge amount of verdict for that as well. So that was my, one of my landmark cases where, um, and this girl today is a. a went back to india and if you meet her today see her what she was before it's a world of difference she's a stewardess now in one of the airlines wow. over confident doing really well and i love seeing that because i see the before and after how beautiful uh, you're also you know just um you know just helping them but you're also just turning their lives over you know from i, I and you know it really aggravates me whether it's a man or a woman and they come and they're being abused that really aggravates me and i'm like why are you putting up with it get the strength get out of it there's so much more out there mm-hmm. it's difficult because we all are scared of change we you know and a rut we are in that family environment we're fighting every day but not pulling out of it so i love to give confidence to them that get out yeah keep yourself safe keep your children safe yeah. children should not be subjected to dv the violence between a couple mm-hmm. should not go down to the children and 99% it does because they are living in that same household i mean you know, and i really tell people why are you traumatized with filing a divorce lot of them oh my god no 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 divorce i'm like yeah but you're okay with subjecting your child to domestic violence and anger in front of them so i am isn't it better to have two parents living separately yeah. being friends and you know parenting their children than to have them literally fighting in front of them yeah that's true and also you know um okay we all already getting so many user questions we are or we already are um 
over one hour now we have extended the show time i mean it was supposed to be uh, to go for an hour but we are uh, you know uh, more than that so i would request if you can please take if you allow me so if you, if i can please take few more uh, viewer questions because they are really really waiting for you to answer if you allow <laughs> just a few more minutes I do have a hearing at uh, one thirty, so I'm good. I'll here. just so. I'll just quickly, you know, okay. try to take as many as, no uh, problem. as I can. Okay. All right. So next, uh, we have is from Somesh. Okay. Somesh is continuously asking, you know, follow up questions. So Somesh wants to know. Yes, ma'am. My wife is in the U.S., but a legal advisor in India said that if I file for uh, divorce, she will file four nine eight A for dowry harassment, and my parents and I will roam courts for years. So the first step is you bring your parents here, keep them safe, mm -hmm. and then file the divorce. I had a situation where four members of the family were first moved to the U.S. They filed their cases uh, in the U.S. The divorce was done, and then eventually the parents went back. In the meantime, you know, file uh, a complaint with the police station that she's threatening you with all of this. So there's already a record. I'm not sure what they call it. Is it a, like a report or a complaint or something they file in the, and I can, you know, recommend an attorney for you in India who could help you with that part and file your divorce here, bring them here. So nothing happens to them and you are, you know, you feel uh, safe. And if your wife is already in the US, once you file the divorce, you get an order from the court that she can't be filing stuff in India. If she has any issues, she files it here. Mm -hmm. So, Somesh, by now you already uh, must be having uh, Seema's, you know, details, her contact number, her mail ID, uh, her website. You can go contact her. You can reach out to her. She can, you know, like she said, she can also recommend you an attorney from India uh, who can help you so that you now you can directly, you know, reach out to her and seek advice. Now, coming to our next viewer, uh, we have this question from, okay. We have this question from Kashmir, if I'm not wrong. Okay, Kashmir has posted this on YouTube. And Kashmir wants to know both Indian, both Indian, child, US citizen, wife, child in India, US declined jurisdiction over child, wife asked Indian court for SSN of both, consent to renew US passport, I need to protect my SSN, what do I do? Yes, so jurisdiction in the U.S. over a child is if the child is in that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. If there is no child in, in the U.S. jurisdiction, uh -huh. they cannot pass orders related to the child. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, why do you have to protect your SSN? SSN for the child should be given, right? Why does she need his SSN? I, I'm unclear. Consent to renew U.S. passport. Whose U.S. passport? The child's U.S. passport. So, um, what he says is, why ask right? Indian court for SSN of both? I think that's why. Both meaning the husband and the wife. Husband and wife, both. Yeah. But they are both Indian citizens. So, are they green card holders here? So, Kashmir, you'll With have to elaborate a bit if you're a green card holder or not, so that you know, um, Seema could like properly give an answer to your question, but because we do not have a clarification on the question right now. So please post your question again. If we have time, we definitely are going to take it. If not, we will be replying to your question. Yeah. Yes, also, please. if she wants consent to renew the child's US passport, you should demand that she brings the child back to the US so you can renew her passport. Okay. This way you bring the child back into the US jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. Uh, after Kashmir, so Kashmir, I hope uh, you've got the answer for your question. If not, please try to elaborate your question a bit so that we can take it um, in few in some time. And now next question is from another viewer called Nisha Singh. Okay. So Nisha has posted this on uh, Facebook and she wants to know, I also want to divorce my husband as I have found a white boyfriend and my husband has refused to pay for my luxury. You mentioned you roped in innocent family to domestic violence. Can you tell me how to do that? I would also like to do that to bend. Um, I'm not sure if she has like completed the question or not, but for this much, okay, chat is cut off somehow. First, but, of, all, yeah. first of all, Nisha, I did not rip, rope any innocent family. I roped a family that was perpetrating domestic violence on a poor child. Right. 
Secondly, if you have a white boyfriend, I'm not sure why your current husband should pay for your luxury. Right. I, I just think it's completely unfair and immoral. Yeah. Yeah. So we are going to have, you know, these kind of questions from the, or, you know, the, the viewers, some are going to be in favor, some are going to be, uh, you know, are going to ask questions so that they can satisfy their demands uh, because they are having this opportunity, you know, so they have a legal maestro uh, who is answering to their questions. So why should they lose this opportunity is what they're thinking, I guess. So now, um, uh, okay, uh, if we can take I, I hope you still have some time or um yeah another five minutes another five, I need to. great thank you so much okay so we still have some view, viewer question uh the next question that we have is from arvind deshpande and arvind wants to know if wife flew with a u.s born child to india what can i do to get back my child back to u.s so um if a wife flew with a u.s born child to india there are proceedings the, the problem is that india is not part of the hate convention and that's where the difficulty arises mm -hmm. but you can uh, you know th there are attorneys who do these uh, cases where uh, you know the wife is kidnapped and that has happened where the u.s courts will enter an order to you know bring the child back how long has it been though mm -hmm. that's that matters a lot if their child has gone for a few years you've not done anything it gets tougher but if they've gone like very recently then you should go to your police department first file a complaint and you know get a lawyer who can help you with filing the paperwork to get an order to bring the uh, uh, you'll have to do some filing of this order in india mm -hmm. because of the they're not part of the hate convention yeah. that's where the difficulty lies and that's why in divorce cases when there are children involved Parents will not let them go to India with the other parent because they feel they'll never come back because India is not part of the hate convention. So it's tough, but it's still doable. And it has happened in a in a case where the mother, uh, you know, she was leaving for India and I think she had flown in and then she was flown back because the police took emergent action. Mm -hmm. So the 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 time frame of when you take that action is very important right. when a child is going to India. If it was any other country that was part of the hate convention the timing would not matter mm -hmm. okay okay so arvin i hope uh you have got a, a great and a clear you know um a good answer for your question and now okay so now that you have said you know we have few minutes to go so i actually would like to take this opportunity by asking my question, I know we still have user question, but before, you know, uh, because uh, we have only uh, a minute or two, so I'm going to take this opportunity to ask my question. And my question is about if you can please explain um, WAWA, which is VAWA and potential eligibility for green card and U visa, and how do they differ? So um, the VAWA stands for Violence Against Women's Act, and it was. Um, you know, the legislature passed it in 1994. Then it was reauthorized many times. And the latest one was in March, I believe, of 2022. And it is landmark legislation that uh, was passed to improve criminal, legal, and community-based uh, responses to DV, to dating violence, to sexual assault, mm -hmm. and, and stalking. And any victims mm -hmm. of these acts could be eligible for um, applying for a green card. Mm -hmm. However, there are there are criteria. First of all, the, the abuser has to be a US citizen, uh, a spouse or a former spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, they can also be a US parent who perpetrated that abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a US citizen um, son or a daughter. Okay. And then you can also be a green card holder who has to have done that, um, you know, the violence upon the, the victim. Mm -hmm or it can be a green card parent who has done it. If uh, those criteria is fit in, mm -hmm. then you can show all the violence you went through. Mm -hmm. You can make an application under, well, I, I believe it's uh, form I-360 and it's a self-petitioning. Mm -hmm. You file it, however, you have to be in the US for that. Mm -hmm. The way that is different from a U visa is mm -hmm. for a U visa, you can be outside the country mm -hmm. to file for a U visa. U visa also is for uh, immigrants um, and you know for victims of crimes who have suffered severe mental and uh, physical abuse uh -huh. and the criteria for that is not only that you've gone through this abuse you also have to be helpful to the law enforcement 
and government officials in their investigation or their prosecution of this criminal activity. So for a U visa, you can be anywhere. And if you can prove these things that, you know, you, um, that you've gone through this physical and, uh, you know, mental anguish, you can be uh, helpful in the investigation of any kind of prosecution of those kind of crimes. And that's when you can get a U visa. Mm -hmm. And when you get a U visa, it's, um, you get a lawful status to work in the in the US. Uh, you can apply for a green card uh, after three years of a U visa is valid for four years. Okay. So you can work in the in the in the US. You get a, a eligibility to work, but after three years of having a U visa, you can apply for a green card. Okay. Okay. So that's the difference between the Violence Against Women's Act mm -hmm. and the, and the U visa. Right. So both can get both are related to uh, crimes mm -hmm. uh, of you know moral turpitude such as domestic violence and then a whole lot of other kidnapping uh, you know there's a whole list mm -hmm. uh, I think I wrote it down here somewhere those are the, the... so see we yeah. have the perfect guest for today's show she has also made notes just so she, you know she can explain them in detail to the audiences. Yes, please go ahead. Because there's such long lists, I have yes. to write those. So it's abduction, abusive sexual contact, blackmail, domestic violence, extortion, false imprisonment, female genital mutilation, fraud and foreign labor, hostage, incest, kidnapping, and slave trade. If you have undergone physical and uh, severe uh, mental uh, abuse for any of these acts, mm -hmm. then you are eligible to get a U visa. But you have to. The second criteria is you have to be helpful to law enforcement or government officials mm -hmm. for them to conduct the investigation and to prosecute those crimes. Okay. Okay. So if you can prove that mm -hmm. and you can get a U visa. All right. Okay. So I hope but, but U visa but U visa is not a green card. It is an eligibility to work. Mm -hmm. However, under VAWA, you get a green card, but you have to present be in this US and it has to be at the hands of a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. or a green card holder. If you have an H4 spouse mm -hmm. who commits domestic violence upon you, you cannot get a VAWA green card. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I hope everyone by now you know the difference between a VAWA and a U visa. So thank you so much for again answering the question in detail and also by making these lovely notes that you have, uh, <laughs> especially you know for a lovely audience. And uh, I know you know you're going to have uh, you, you are about to have an about to have a hearing at one thirty. So, yes. but still you you know managed to give us time. Yeah, but you still managed to give us time. So I'm so thankful for you for that. And it was a pleasure having you on the show. It was a first episode, but it didn't feel like one. And we are going to have many more in the um, coming, uh, you know, weeks. And we are going to, because like I said, I have a lot of user questions, you know, viewer questions. Um, I can see them, you know, on my screen and also have my own question, which I actually have written, uh, which I needed to ask from you. But not for today ask your question no. yeah. let me ask your question sometime ask your question okay all right so if uh, you allow me so shall i take a viewer question or my own question your question all right okay so if you can uh, talk about you know are there special um, okay we already have a question on screen then how long does temporary restraining order last and what happens when it expires a tro never expires Okay. It has to either be converted to a final restraining order uh -huh. or it has to be dismissed or withdrawn. The court can dismiss it or you or the person filing it can withdraw it. Uh -huh. But it stays there till one of these things happen. Uh -huh. But the courts, if they are going to hear it, they try and schedule it within 10 days of it being entered. But the reality, is, it's never 10 days. I've had TROs that we drag it for like three months. I've had one that I just had. We push, pushed it for three months because we were trying to get them to settle um, you know, not obviously reconcile, but settle their uh, civil restraint rather than convert it into a final restraining order through a trial because it would negatively impact the abuser's employment. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, also, um, you know, as you can see the question on screen, um, can a TRO be extended? And if yes, under what circumstances? Okay. All right. I just answered that. Yeah. 
Okay, so again, thank you so much, uh, Attorney Seema, for coming to the thank show. You. The show, it was such a pleasure having you on the show. And like I said, it was the first episode with you, but it didn't feel like one. We are going to have many more in the coming weeks, and we are going to have a second episode for the same topic, which is domestic violence and immigration consequences. We are going to have a second episode um, next Tuesday. So everyone, just um, stay tuned and keep on watching Immigration and Job Talk Show because we are going to have Attorney Seema back. But for now, thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Rajni, and thank you to all the viewers and listeners. Um, I appreciate your uh, participation, and hopefully, I've answered to the best of my ability. If you have any questions, reach out to me, and we're happy to help you. And everybody, thank you, and stay blessed. All right, you have our details on screen. You can please note them down. And to our lovely, lovely viewers who are watching us right now, thank you so much for joining us. Like I said, we'll be back. But for now, you'll have to give us a break because it's been, I think, more than an hour. And uh, it was a great informative show, engaging show. And we love your engagement as well. So thank you so much for that, uh, for that as well. And for now, like I always say, Keep watching, stay tuned with Immigration and Jobs Talk Show and never ever forget to subscribe to us. Bye for now.